are sensitive areas all over the world. But I believe that uh, with proper statesmanship, with proper respect for world opinion, we can prevent a catastrophe, an atomic holocaust. He was a Renaissance man who thrived in the 20th century. He advocated a worldview at a time of nationalistic fervor. He was universally acclaimed as a man of principle, a man of peace, and a man of matchless eloquence. Premier Yoshida yes. was in San Francisco as head of the Japanese mission. Premier Yoshida asked for a, an assignment to see me in my hotel. So I consented to be to have a conference with Premier Yoshida. So that was big news then, because it was the first time that a Japanese would have a conference with a Philippine official. And having been in the war myself with General MacArthur in Batam and Corridor, I understand Premier Yoshida was very anxious to see me. So when he entered my room, all the television representatives were there, radio and newspaper men. And when we shook hands, he said to me, let us forget the past. And I said to him, yes, Your Excellency, but it must be, not be repeated. I said, to us, bygones can be bygones, but we must have a pledge from you that from your point of view, such bygones cannot be repeated and must not be repeated. He was a passionate crusader for peace, and he worked tirelessly to bring about a first world order. The international community has repeatedly called for a comprehensive political solution to the Kampuchean problem, which will provide for the withdrawal of all foreign forces and ensure respect for the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and neutral and now non-aligned status of Kampuchea, as well as the right of the Kampuchean people to self-determination free from outside interference. Educator, soldier, journalist, author, diplomat, and statesman. Carlos P. Romulo was a Filipino whose outlook extended far beyond the Philippine shores. A Filipino who embraced the concept of globalization decades before it became a reality. A Filipino whose vision was revolutionary and yet so accurate that it is as relevant today as it was in his lifetime. And our president Quezon here, when I arrived, he said to me, Romulo, you're a damn fool. The Japanese will never dare attack Japan, America. They don't have the resources. I said, more than that, Mr. President, Japan will attack before the end of the year. This was in September. And I said, if they attack and there is a war, colonization will end. And the president said, I say again, you're a damn fool, Romulo. You cannot be wiser than Churchill. Churchill said, he's the prime minister of Great Britain to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. You cannot be wiser than Churchill. I said, Mr. President, he was speaking as an imperialist. I believe the imperialist days are over. And if there is a war, whether Japan will lose or win, colonization will end. Carlos P. Romulo was born to Gregorio Romulo and Maria Peña on January 14, 1898 in Camilin, Tarlac. It was a time of ferment. The Filipino-American War was then raging. As destiny would have it, the infant born on that day would grow up to be the embodiment of both cultures in one individual. There was particularly, I can remember now, a Texas sergeant in the cavalry. And I can still smell his tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> and he could spit and hit something 20 feet. <laughs> Carlos P. Romulo began a career in journalism at 15 while still in high school. At 31, 
he was editor-in-chief of a chain of publications, and later in his 30s, he was publisher of a principal Commonwealth daily. He won the prestigious Pulitzer Prize for Journalism in 1941 for a series of articles anticipating Japanese aggression in Asia. Even when history called on him to turn to more active participation, he never turned away from the spoken and written word. He occupied a truly unique position that allowed him not only to shape events in their making, but also to step back and shape them again in their telling. He authored a total of 17 books, including a novel, works of non-fiction, poetry, drama, and an autobiography modestly entitled, I Walked with Heroes. In 1984, he was named a national artist for literature. Early in life, Romolo was a teacher. He was an assistant professor and later on chairman of the English department at the University of the Philippines. In the 60s, while in the middle of his multifaceted career in politics, diplomacy and journalism. Romulo returned to the University of the Philippines to serve as its president. At the same time, he served as Secretary of Education. Having been president of the University of the Philippines, that has been a fruitful and meaningful position that I've held because it gave me the chance to uh, listen to the youth, to be close to the youth, to be infused by the youth with their uh, impulsiveness and their energy and their uh, determination. And at the same time, I can share with them my experience, uh, the feelings of moderation, the spirit of looking twice before making a decision and inspire them with what I feel is the idealism that has been the center a motive of my life all these years. Although his image was intricately linked to the United States and the English language, Romulo was, in fact, one of the early champions of the development and propagation of a literature written in the national language. He was a defender of academic freedom, an exponent of academic excellence, and a staunch supporter of student rights. In addition to the master's degree that he earned from Columbia University in 1921, Romulo has received over 70 honorary degrees from universities all over the world. A general in both the U.S. and Philippine armies, Carlos Romulo served as General MacArthur's aide-de-camp in World War II. My assignment was to take care of the voice of freedom, to tell the people the truth of what was happening. And so I was attached to the staff of General MacArthur in Manila. Ordered by General MacArthur to tell the story of Bataan and Corregidor, he tirelessly campaigned for the liberation of the Philippines through moving speeches delivered across the United States from 1942 to 1945. His accounts of the extraordinary courage of the Filipino and American resistance are detailed in his book, I Saw the Fall of the Philippines which was a bestseller in the United States and was the focal point of his lectures throughout America during this period. Carlos Romulo returned to the Philippines as a member of President Osmeño's cabinet and landed in Leyte with General MacArthur in 1944. We waded ashore. Under my feet, I felt the crunch of my land my country again, the earth of the Philippines. In that moment, on the beach, there flashed through my mind a picture I vowed never to forget, the picture of our dead who had been piled to the water's edge on Bataan. And I thought to myself, how much easier they will rest tonight the first thing I saw later was the Filipino flag hoisted on a coconut tree and side by side with it, the American flag. Within a space of three years, 
we had compressed the greatest story in all freedom's history. Bataan was the first chapter. Many more would be written in the mingled blood of Filipinos and Americans before all the Filipinos would again be free. But here, on this beach, was democracy's story. We had returned. He has been awarded numerous medals and honors in recognition of his contribution to the war effort. His service to his nation and the world did not end with the Second World War. General Romulo was a moving force behind the shaping of the charter creating the United Nations in 1945. Today, we are gathered at a desperate hour to save the peace of the world. The voice of freedom thus became the big voice of small nations. He championed the cause of freedom for the then colonized peoples of the world and fought that their right to self-determination be recognized in the UN Charter. He became the first Asian elected president of the United Nations General Assembly in 1949. He also served as president of the United Nations Security Council twice in 1957 and in 1980. And so I declare the meeting is adjourned. In recognition of his contributions to world diplomacy, he was awarded the United Nations Peace Award in 1982. I present to you uh, this highest award of the United Nations. And uh, I wish uh, uh, to tell you again how grateful we are to you. I extend to you on this occasion and also uh, to your charming lady, uh, Mrs. Romero my warmest and very best wishes for your good health and first success in your future. Thank you very much. And two years later, the U.S. government awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest decoration conferred on civilians. At home, he was equally inspiring and no less invaluable to the life of the nation. This is not for me. It is for our younger generation to realize that our republic is not ungrateful and that public service is given due recognition by those who have in their hands the destiny of our republic. He served under all elected Philippine presidents, from Manuel Quezon to Ferdinand Marcos, in various crucial positions, notably as ambassador to the United States in 1952 to 1962, and as Secretary of Foreign Affairs for a total of 17 years, from 1950 to 1952, and again from 1969 to 1984. A lustrous and distinguished career of a man who devoted his life to a dream of a peaceful world. Quote, to a time when no child shall lie down in terror or waken to hunger, but shall know himself as a being of unique value in a safer and kindlier world. End of quote. We are all inheritors of this man's great works. At least three generations of Filipinos owe him a debt of gratitude for his long, fruitful, and faithful services to his people, his native land, and the world. <laughs>